Welcome to part two. Much of the opening segments in the player's handbook is the standard fare of what is this book. If you've played any D20 based games, you'll be familiar with some or all of what's being discussed here. The only real standout that I need to discuss in this section is the advantage and disadvantage mechanic, wherein you roll the relevant D20 check and roll twice and keep the higher or lower result, respectively. On paper, there's nothing wrong with this mechanic. It is in execution that the real problem makes itself apparent. The advantage-disadvantage mechanic's main problem is the fact that, when using it for purely situational benefits or disadvantages, it works perfectly fine. When it's being used as a crux in class features, that's where the problem really lies. The player's handbook presents itself into three parts. Part 1 covers character creation, Part 2 covers the game's primary mechanics, and Part 3 covers spells. The remaining sections are a series of appendices to cover the miscellaneous information. Character creation is performed in four steps. Ability scores, race, class, and background. Additionally, 5th edition is reverting back to 20 levels and eschewing the half level bonus in favor of proficiency bonus at plus 2 at level 1 and additional plus 1 every 4 levels after the fact. While this is somewhat more balanced at higher levels compared to the half level bonus from 4th edition, it removes some of the gradual upgrading from previous editions. Ability scores are the basic six that have been D&D and its derivatives, and are generated via random roll or point spending. In addition, ability scores are the determining factor for saving throws, which this time are merely an ability check instead of generated through the previous two editions' calculations. My problem with this is that they weren't willing to go all the way with this emphasis on ability scores. The idea, according to the Legends and Lore articles on it, was to simplify the defenses from 4th edition and the saves as rolls in 3rd edition. But not only did they sidestep the problem by still having the static attack attribute, i.e. strength for all melee attacks, but they gave magic attacks and defenses for spellcasting classes anyway, thus completely missing the mark on simplicity. In regard to races, each race gets a brief description of its abilities and traits, though far more attention is placed on the basic four of human, dwarf, elf, and half-elf. Each basic race has two sub-races to pick from, differing only in their ability score bonus and a few racial abilities. Classes are detailed next, which I'll delve into one by one. But before I do, there are a few motifs in the classes that I have to go over. First, hit dice appear to be 5th edition's version of healing surges, but I think they missed the point of that mechanic for two reasons. One, the recovered amount is randomized via die rolls. And two, they can only be used after combat, not during. The purpose of Healing Surges was an abstract recovery to add self-sufficiency to characters and parties without a dedicated healer. The hit die doesn't really do that. Second, at every fourth level, you may increase two ability scores by one or one ability score by two. On paper, this seems fine, but having this act as a replacement for feats distances the game from the sense of accomplishment that builds Grant. I'll get to that later on. Third, it should be noted that each class has two or three sets of abilities as a subclass based on the choice of class ability taken at third level. Personally, I'd have used these abilities as something like Talent Trees from D20 Modern or Saga Edition, rather than the one-path approach that this game is going for. This can lead to a degree of pigeonholing. Finally, there's an inconsistency in the way weapon and armor proficiencies are presented. For the most part, it seems that they're using a motif of light, medium, heavy, something that 4th edition only did for weapons, as simple, military, and superior, roughly. In several classes, they break that, however, by mentioning specific weapons. This is admittedly a minor thing, but is veering close to that cleric can only use blunt weapons silliness of earlier editions. First is the Barbarian, which is going back to the one-size-fits-all form of raging that it had in the past, as an activated ability rather than a post-attack stance. Granted, the use of advantage makes it somewhat more manageable than in 3.x, but the fact that rage will work the same for every Barbarian is something I'm not fond of. The Barbarian subclasses are the Berserker, which is themed around the Rage ability, and the Totem Warrior, which is themed around spirit animals as a companion, a la the Shaman. The Bard seems to have also reverted to 3rd edition's mindset, and all the problems that come with it. The Bard's the first class in the book so far that uses magic, so I should take the time to mention that I am not fond of the return of the Vancian model. However, that's a can of worms to be opened another day. Anyway, the bard in this case seems to be focused on the jack-of-all-trades nature and the ability to buff the party. The problem, once again, is that D&D is a game of focused roles, 
making the complaint about the rules in 4th edition that I kept hearing somewhat silly. Therefore, having someone that does a little bit of everything won't be able to keep up as well. The Bard's subclasses are colleges, which are themed around either its generous abilities, the College of Lore, or enhancing combat ability in the College of Valor. Clerics have regressed into the good-at-magic-and-melee nature they previously had, and more specifically into a one-size-fits-all cleric that has a series of undead-centric features, namely how much focus is put into turn undead. Clerics' subclasses are domains, which provide it with a set of channel divinity abilities and domain-themed spells that they can add to their potential spell list. The domains presented are Knowledge, Life, Light, Nature, Tempest, Trickery, and War. I think the issue I have with the approach is that pigeonholing I mentioned before, especially since it carries the idea that a cleric's god would only have one domain, and thus the cleric only focuses on one domain. However, I suppose it had to be done this way for the sake of tradition, and because there's nothing in the way of god creation in this book, and only a minuscule amount of god creation and pantheon creation in the Dungeon Master's Guide. The druid is also a victim of regression, but utilizing wild shape instead of channel divinity. However, it only has two subclasses, called Druidic Circles. These emphasize either its spellcasting abilities or the transformations of the Druid. Additionally, I am not fond of having Druids, a class which gets its powers from primal forces, having to prepare their spells. Fighters seem to be one of the few classes that haven't suffered as much regression, and is actually one of the better classes presented in the book. Well, two-thirds of the fighter, anyway. Much of the fighter's abilities are cribbed from some of 4th edition's core mechanics, namely extra actions and in-combat healing. In addition, a series of combat styles are presented to accentuate the use of certain weapons. The subclasses of the fighter could be considered to be the sole exception to what I've said about the subclass concept, since two of the three subclasses it gets have new mechanics unto themselves. The champion is a stock-and-trade subclass emphasizing durability, but the battlemaster and eldritch knight are more intricate, being an incarnation of the maneuvers from Tome of Battle, and an incarnation of the Sword Mage, respectively. Much of the monk's abilities are callbacks to 3.x's version of him, with a minor wrinkle in its key points resource, which is expended by actions like Flurry of Blows and their evasive techniques. While the monk still has a focus on their mobility, it's hampered by the approach that 5e has to spatial combat, but I'll get into that later. The monk's subclasses are called Monastic Traditions, and compose the bulk of the key abilities that one will get over the course of their adventuring career. Way of the Open Hand emphasizes the martial arts, whereas Way of Shadows focuses on stealth abilities, ostensibly making it a ninja class, and Way of the Four Elements is tied to elemental spellcasting and its relation to key. The word bender came up frequently in discussion regarding that subclass. Paladins are closer to their 3.x version, though the mount is not present here and instead opting for a kind of hybrid of the features available to the fighter and cleric. Its Lay on Hands ability is treated as a pool of hit points they can gift to another person, and Smiting is treated as a damage upgrade from burning a spell slot that they have. The Paladin's subclasses are the Oaths, Devotion, Vengeance, and the Ancients, and act largely like a cleric's domains. The added wrinkle is that the Oaths have rules that the Paladin must follow. I get the feeling this was an attempt to still have the typical vows of a Paladin, but without having the constraints of an alignment system and thus the infamous fall effect that a lot of paladins suffered in earlier games. However, it creates new problems since there's no real re mechanical repercussion for breaking the oaths, just a DM sidebar that amounts to fluff. Rangers can once again use magic, assumedly drawing on the same forces as the druid. Now their actual combat abilities are very few, focusing more on the lay of an area and fighting specific monsters, making them more like hunters than anything else in my opinion. Not to mention that the specific creature's motif has its usefulness dependent solely on the GM, in contrast with the marking that it had in 4th edition. The ranger's subclasses are archetypes, and focus on either combating a favorite enemy, or animal companionship, the hunter and beastmaster respectively. The majority of the rogue's abilities are akin to its approach in 3.x, and thus skill use and the sneak attack are its focus. Its subclasses are called archetypes, and emphasize either the rogue's urban mobility with the thief, sneak attacks with the assassin, or delving into illusion magic with the arcane trickster. Sorcerers use a mix of the fancy and spell slots and sorcery points, which can be expended to either create new spell, spell slots, or have spell slots expended to create sorcery points, or even modify the effects of spells. 
Their subclasses are sorcerous origins and reflect the sorcerer's heritage, be that of dragons or chaotic wild magic. Warlocks are treated more unorthodox than the other spellcasting classes in the book, especially concerning their use of spell slots. A warlock's class features are centered around their subclass, here called the Otherworldly Patron, and may take the form of an Archfey, a Demon, or a Great Old One. As such, they gain their subclass at first level rather than third. And unlike the subclasses for clerics, the spells given from a patron are additions to the spell list you can pick from, not spells you automatically gain. Additionally, they do not gain spell slots by level. They always cast spells at the level shown by their character level when they expend a spell slot. Finally, warlocks have a set of spell-like abilities known as invocations, many of which allow for unique effects based around their choice of pact features or allow them to cast a certain spell for free. There are even some that allow them to cast spells that they would normally not have access to, even if it's only once per day. Wizards are one of the many classes that have regressed, though one of the main differences in this case is that their subclass provides features emphasizing one of the spheres of magic, abjuration, conjuration, evocation, divination, enchantment, illusion, necromancy, and transmutation. The other main change is their ability to recover some spell slots at higher levels, and even have certain spells be considered as always prepared. Overall, the classes have some good and bad points, but many of them come up with steps back rather than forward, as I repeatedly stated. That said, the Fighter and Warlock are probably the two best designed classes in the book, since they're not falling back on traditions for tradition's sake as much. After classes comes background, which seems to be the game's way of separating skill layouts from the aforementioned classes, as well as providing a starting set of equipment and a role-playing style feature. Each one has a set of suggested personality traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws. These are crucial for gaining inspiration, a way to reward role-playing these characteristics by having them grant an advantage to a single role. While backgrounds in and of themselves are fine, I think treating backgrounds like mini-classes was a mistake. It would have been far better to have it as parts placed together by the players a la the life path system in Cyberpunk and Mechton. In addition, inspiration allows for someone to game their role-playing especially since there's no counterweight against breaking their personality traits or a means to overcome their flaws. It comes off more as an imitation of a narrative system rather than an execution of it. Chapter 5 focuses on equipment. Now much of the equipment is standard fare for D&D, with armor and weapons working nearly identical to how they did in previous editions, though equipment's special properties are far lessened here. Sadly, magic items are not detailed here. That, unfortunately, is in the DM's guide, which I'll get to later. One note I did find interesting is how, instead of adding an attack or damage bonus, weapons with the versatile tag have their damage die increased by one step when wielding it two-handed. Chapter 6 discusses customization options, namely multiclassing and feats. Multiclassing works largely how it did in 3.x, minus the overcomplicated XP calculations. What's mainly discussed here is how certain class features interact and or stack if they even do. Later on, feats are presented as an alternative to the ability score increases every four levels, with most of the feats being in the general or basic combat motif instead of the more specialized approach that was in previous games or some of their spin-offs. I'm not entirely fond of feats used in this manner, due to it adding a growing problem they have with the game's treatment of customization. Feats, in my opinion, are supposed to represent the character taking what they'd learned from their choice of class and making it their own, and 5e's take on it does not seem to get that. Chapter 7 details the use of ability scores and is the first chapter of Part 2. 5th edition seems to want to place greater emphasis on the character's ability scores and their subsequent modifiers over the features granted from other sources, ostensibly because ability scores are supposed to be the most important aspect. While skill uses and saving throws are directly tied to ability scores more so here, plus any applicable proficiency bonus. In addition to the problem with this I mentioned before, there's also a wider discrepancy between abilities, and thus between defenses of certain attacks or events. Also, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention how initiative can potentially have the progressionless issue that was in 3.x, where initiative essentially stayed the same for certain characters' entire careers. Chapter 8 is on adventuring. This chapter is mainly on the narrative mechanics of travel, vision, terrain, and campaign time, as well as what to do outside of the adventures. Very little of this is different from the previous editions, so I've been skimming over it. Chapter 9 details combat. Combat still operates on the initiative-based approach, but much of the action economy 
and anything mini or grid related has largely been gutted compared to its previous edition. Instead of an economy of actions, we have a halfway mix between the grid-based combat and a narrative approach. And as a result, much of the game's sense of tactics has been gutted or treated as optional. But the system isn't willing to go fully narrative with any sort of dramatic mechanics, opting instead to imply special effects with a DM fills in the blanks attitude. That said, there are a few improvements. Two weapon fighting is much smoother in this case and isn't as heavy on penalties, and the change to damage resistance and vulnerability allows for an easier calculation. However, I'm not fond of having criticals just double the damage dice, as it's dangerously close to the number spiking that 3.x's double damage after confirmation did. Chapter 10 delves into spellcasting, and is the first chapter of part 3. For me, the fact that magic is getting its own chapter again sets a bad precedent, as does the return of Vancian spell slots. I will freely admit I've never been a fan of that model as presented in D&D and other works, and my reasons are too numerous to summarize here. For the time being, I'll say it doesn't really mesh with the high fantasy kind of setting that D&D strives for. There's a video to be made in of itself on D&D's bizarre relationship with the kind of fantasy it is. Granted, the only real changes to the formula that 5e makes is the treatment of cantrips as at-will spells, and the idea of spells having varied effects depending on the level of the slot expended. It's been argued that cantrips are overpowered in this game, and I can definitely see it, since cantrips can deal damage and have that damage upgraded over time, while a non-magic weapon cannot in this case. And no, the damage improvements of certain classes is not a reliable trade-off since many of those effects are relying on a finite resource. While I will credit them for not taking the arcane divine separation here, there is still the issue of everyone using the same stuff, with many of the magic classes using a largely similar pool of spells throughout all nine levels. The remaining sections are a series of appendices, which cover the mechanics of conditions, 5e's Pantheons and Planes, a bizarre mix of the 4th edition planes and the dimensions of Planescape, as well as the Great Wheel from Forgotten Realms, and a sample set of creatures. The latter I will not get into at this time because I want to save that for the Monster Manual. Speaking of which, in Part 3, we'll set our sights on the Monster Manual.